this is going to take the form of a sort of live coding thing here. So the, uh, the code that I'm about to show you is all up online on this repo. If anyone's interested enough to clone it, don't feel obliged, but it is there. Um, and I'll leave that up at the end if anyone's kind of interested. Um, so I don't know who here is sort of familiar with parser combinators or what they do or vaguely. Just raise your hand if you've sort of used them or read about them. OK, that's, that's a fair few. So um, yeah, the basic principle um, is we wanted to use them to parse um, some files. Um, now, they started off looking a bit like this. Now, obviously, building a parser combinator to parse something like this is massively overkill. We were just using the type safe now light bend library. But the things started to get a bit more complicated. Um, this is a sort of much, much sort of smaller example of how stuff started to go. Um, you can see things like sort of Boolean logic here and whatnot that would have been basically impossible to do um, with the type safe libraries. And even stuff like having an ordered map, um, by default, this would be coerced into an unordered map in type safe. So this is something that we want to, to avoid sort of the problems with. Um, so I'm just sort of going to talk you through here how we sort of built up something that parses this um, and kind of how that um, gives us some capabilities that we wouldn't have got from some of the more sort of built-in um, config parsing libraries. So first things first, uh, what do you need to get started with parse combinators? You need uh, basically just this one library um, and hopefully a testing one, uh, unless you're an absolute cowboy. Um, so to parse something simple like this, um, first of all, we needed to be able to build um, some pretty primitive stuff. Um, so we want to be able to parse strings. Uh, in particular, we want to be able to parse two different types of string. We want to be able to parse what we normally think of as a string. We would want to be able to parse bare words, so not wrapped in double quotes. And there are a few other things, um, integers here. So start off just by building out some of the basics. This is a, a little bit clustered here, so I'm just going to separate this out. Um, basically, what we have um, is we have a bare word parser. And this is just start off with standard, um, you know, standard regex uh, thing here. So with parser combinators, um, what you can do is you can sort of extend, extend this base uh, parser thing. That'll give you um, a lot of, sort of the base methods there. So you can build out like a regex parser. Uh, it'll give you sort of the power to um, sort of produce a parse method, which we'll see later. Um, and with the Java token parser here, which is just to provide us with a string literal def definition, which we don't want to write out ourselves. Um, so bare word. Fairly simple stuff um, can potentially include numbers after the initial character. It's some number of characters. It produces a string. It's pretty simple stuff. Um, as far as the string goes, so we have a string literal that the Java token parsers uh, provide for us here. Some cryptic stuff here. Um, we don't really care about that. We just know that it's going to include the double quotes at the end. So we want to take a substring excluding the first and the last character. And then we're just going to do a couple of basic replaces to um, replace backslash um, double quotes of that's in the string with uh, a single uh, double quotation mark so that we get what we expect when we put strings in. We don't actually use this anywhere, but it's good to do things properly. Um, and then we can start to combine them. This is where the parser combinator part starts to actually become combinator. Um, so for example, here we have s. This indicates either form of the string. So in something like this, um, time out one second, Obviously, what that means, this should also be fine. If this isn't fine, you know, you've just made things a little bit too hard or a little bit unnecessarily hard for the people who are using uh, your config file who are scoping things out for this. So um, we provide this sort of combination here. What this symbol does um, basically says, look, I'll try and parse it as a bare word. If I can't, I'll try and parse it as a string. Bob's your uncle. Um, int, again, we don't really want that to be uh, surrounded by double quotation marks. So that's not going to be using this. It's just a bare word. I'm going to map that to a to int. Um, basic string literals, fairly solid stuff. But when we combine them uh, in, that's the wrong one. Um, when we combine them, um, we can start to do things like this. So for this simple config here, we have um, a service, which is going to have a URL and a timeout. Um, to be able to do that, I keep clicking the wrong one here. This is rubbish. Um, we want to have a URL first, uh, which is going to be a string. And I'll get to this sort of magic little bit here, there in a sec. And we can have a timeout which is, in this case, just going to be a bare word. We know what order it's going to come into. So what this basically means is parse this first, um, throw it away, take a separator, which is hopefully going to appear there. 
It's just a literal. It's either a colon or an equals. We're pretty uh, Catholic about what we accept on that. And then it's going to be some form of string. Um, and we throw everything away on the left-hand side of this. So although we know we've read URL, we've read a separator, we don't actually want to parse that. We're not interested in it. It's not going to change what we do with anything. Um, we are interested in the string. So that's the first part. And then we're going to get a timeout, and we're going to get a bare word there. So we've basically just given ourselves a URL, which we're going to do some pattern matching here. This is actually just literally map. I can write map here. It'll do the same thing. Um, so we pattern match on that. We know that the first one's URL. We know the second one's a timeout. We're going to produce a service from that. Um, now, this is actually a little bit rigid. So it lets us define a service like this. What it doesn't let us do is define a service like that. It's already determined the order there. Now, for something so small, that's fair enough. We can probably have some convention about that. By the time we start having multiple different fields, again, if you've used type safe, you'll know that there is no restriction on the order in which you declare stuff, obviously, because it's config. Um, and we want to have that sort of capability here as well. So we want to be able to do something like this as well. Um, so how did we solve that problem here? Um, we decided that instead of just concatenating the parsers together like that, um, we'd have some options of parsers here. Now, we can't actually, because um, this first parser produces a service, so um, obviously this thing with a URL and timeout field is not the same kind of a thing as a base string. Um, so just sort of having either this um, sort of a service parser or an int parser, and then sort of mapping over that. We have to do um, too many uh, bits of shenanigans to make that work sort of properly. So what we've done um, is actually have an individual stage, which is a parser from this configuration file um, to another version of the configuration file. It will literally just override a field with whatever we've extracted of the appropriate type. So we're able to say, look, this is a service, so I'm going to override the service. This is a port, I'm going to override the port. And it's much like regex. We can sort of match on uh, zero or more. And you see that describes exactly what that does. Um, so we can combine these things together, simply fold over them on an empty thing. This actually does look fine. It's not too long. It's just that the presentation mode doesn't quite have the right length on the line. Um, but we just basically fold over it. Um, we have this function, which we're parsing out, and we're applying it over. Um, so we start with a simple empty one, and we just apply it over. And so that's sort of. One of the slightly sneakier things that we found that we started to do um, when we were sort of parsing these files to enable us to have a little bit more flexibility. There's some other things we wanted to have. We also wanted to be able to have comments. Now, this kind of comment you can't have in TypeSafe. Our config file was getting pretty complex. It was kind of useful to have that, especially for the block comments, um, which again are kind of illegal. You can do it um, just by having, if you're sort of using a standard sort of TypeSafe parser, just by having lots of sort of one line comments. But, um, especially if you are commenting out like a whole section, it can be pretty useful to be able to do these things and to be able to do them arbitrarily all around your code. So that's where these magic bits are coming in. This is actually not the standard parser combinator syntax. The standard parser combinator syntax is that. What these are are slightly magic helpers that we built out ourselves. So how do we do that? Implicit classes. Implicit classes are the bomb. This basically allows us to just, instead of using the default um, sort of uh, left arrow thing, right arrow thing. Um, we've defined what a comment looks like. So here we have, um, that looks like a block comment to me. Uh, and here we have our sort of one line comments. And we basically said, look, you can just have any um, number of comments sort of anywhere around uh, the components of these parsers that you're concatenating together. And that just gives us that just little bit of extra syntax with the parser combinators um, to let us do things like this in our files. Um, so proof is in the pudding. Ideally, this should actually parse some tests. If it doesn't, that's a nightmare. I'll be all good. So um, there's one other little bit here. So we've got the simple config, which is the basic one. We've got one which is in a different order in terms of the declaration of the top level things. Um, and we've got the one with comments. What we also have is a bad one here. So this, this is not parsable. Um, if you would do this with type safe, again, it would extract a value. It would just call it URL bad. It wouldn't tell you immediately what was wrong. But as you can see from that test, hopefully, uh, this is actually a pretty useful error message. Um, in this instance, it's actually giving us the exact character. That almost never happens. This just happens to be a really, really simple um, case that's sort of been spec'd out for this demo. So um, in most cases, you'll be able to tune it to give you the line. But um, it's normally a little bit more effort than it's worth to give you the exact character uh, on where things sort of went wrong. But it's still 
pretty useful to be able to jump straight away, especially if you have a large sort of thousand line config uh, file, um, to be able to sort of jump straight to where the errors are on that. So that's how you do something simple, but that doesn't really justify why we're using parser combinators. Again, this is just something that's already there by default if you use some other libraries. So when we start doing stuff like this with the Boolean combination logic, this is where it starts to get a little bit more interesting. Um, and actually, it's fairly easy to define something that will parse things into a Boolean model um, using parser combinators. So what we have here, pretty basic sort of Boolean, uh, let's just do that, um, sort of Boolean uh, definition here. So we've got some trees, we've got um, some condition types, a unary condition, which in this case is just going to include not, we've got binary conditions and an or. Um, and we've got nodes of various types. So this is a sealed trait. We know that if something is a Boolean node, it's going to be defined in this file. Um, we have a leaf, uh, which is going to be of type T. There's a reason it's of type T. Um, if you look here, it looks like you could probably get away with it all being string. But actually, um, and please don't hate on the syntax. It works phenomenally well in practice. Um, to be able to have a type T, which is actually a pair, for example, so that you can provide some function from a pair of strings to a Boolean and actually uh, process like an entire um, sort of Boolean tree uh, using that function can actually be phenomenally useful for what we needed. Um, so an example of sort of how we'd parse things out into that, um, again, pretty simple with the ands and the ors, you know, and looks like this, or looks like that. Um, not just for shits and giggles, we can have the uh, sort of standard logical not symbol there as well as our more familiar exclamation mark. Um, and then we get into some fun mutual recursion. Um, so this is basically uh, a conditional which has brackets around it. The reason for separating that out separately um, is because you might, you don't really want to have to wrap everything at the top level with brackets all the time it's just because it's combining stuff. It's just that a little bit of extra noise. Um, so Again, all of this is online. This is probably a bit too in-depth to go into sort of fully here. Um, but you can basically see that um, we can define some sort of interesting rules here. Um, we don't have um, sort of operator precedence defined in this file. Uh, we actually make an assertion on this line, um, which basically says, if you do have sort of A and B and C, that's fine, because um, all of the sort of interpolated operations are the same, distinct size one. Um, if you would have different ones, it would throw an exception there, and it wouldn't parse. Uh, it just makes things a lot easier. In the end of the day, it's not hard to put some brackets in for that. Um, so that lets us sort of create these uh, generic sort of Boolean trees, parsing from something from a type, which could be a string or something else, uh, and use it in kind of an interesting way, potentially. So um, we have, oh, uh, don't worry about this. Obviously, this top test is not like a vital kind of test. This is the sort of thing that you write out to make sure that things are actually parsing. No one's going to really care about the exact details of what the structure is. But this is um, actually what this structure here is parsing into. Um, so it's obviously a lot terser to be able to express it in this manner. Um, but uh, as you can see from the test, which should, there we go, it did parse. Um, it does sort of parse out into this sort of expanded binary tree thing. Um, but let's look at that example, that, um, that sort of Boolean operator example here. So like, I was struggling to think of a motivating example for this, because the actual use case we use it in has way too much background, and being able to explain in this talk would have been pretty much impossible. But like, let's imagine that um, these keys here are namespaces, uh, that these are variables, and that this is just some Boolean expression about those variables. I want to say, you know, var1 and var2 or var3. I mean, we can all read this, right? Um, and the test sort of lets us see that that's, um, so if we feed in sort of variable values here, so var1 is true, var2 is true, false, false. Um, and we're just going to feed it into the model that we generated from that. Um, so here's our conditionals. And does it show that we met the right condition? So if var1 two and var2 is true, um, does it hit the top thing? It hits the top thing. So this is like a case statement in this case, because we've constructed an ordered sort of uh, key value thing. So it's going to try them uh, line by line. It, is the case that var1 is true and var2 is true, which means that it matches this conditional, so we get match condition 2 here. So um, if anyone's sort of doubting or curious about how this works, these tests sort of all parse and do the right things here. Um, so it's pretty interesting um, sort of how uh, it's sort of used in practice. It's a bit of a shame I can't go sort of more into it. Um, but an example of how it works uh, with sort of a different sort of leaf type uh, with the, the string string there um, is it's pretty much the same parser. You can see. Here is um, the actual parser. Um, and oh, that's the wrong thing, sorry. 
So here is the actual usage of the parser. We've got the, uh, the MyLogic model there, which is just with the basic one, uh, which is uh, with the nodes type string. And we've got one here where it's a type string string. And we're basically able to reuse almost all the same logic there. We have to define a way of parsing the leaves. So in this case, uh, we want to be able to parse this slightly funky looking thing here. Um, so that requires an additional rule. Um, but for um, our sort of basic one, it's just, it's just our friend s again. So it's a, a simple sort of bare word or normal string um, that we can parse out on that. So we're able to reuse a lot of the, the code there. So this sort of type just bleeds through all the way into the, the base of the, the combinators on that. Um, now, we did run into a few problems when we were doing this sort of kind of elaborate stuff. Um, what's sort of maybe wasn't apparent if you didn't notice it was actually what we're looking up sometimes is basically a string format template. Now, with something like this, this is fine. We can use sort of standard Java string format stuff. We can use this string directly, uh, and we can format it with the stuff that we needed to format it with. Unfortunately, in some cases, uh, we wanted to be able to format that with some Arabic. And although it works, it's pretty hard to see what's going on here. Um, this percent one dollar s has actually been broken up sort of around this Arabic word here, because Arabic reads right to left. It, gets, it actually renders better in IntelliJ than it does in some other formats, but it's completely impossible to work with this. Um, there is no way that you can look at this and see what's going on. Um, so we had a little play around with some different syntax to see, is there a way um, that we can make this render a little bit better so that we can see what's going on? And it turns out there is, if you use slash number slash, that actually gets ordered correctly um, with Arabic, uh, in particular because they, by default, write numbers left to right, but they put them in right to left in their strings. So when it's rendered um, by something that's sufficiently smart, and the IntelliJ renderer is sufficiently smart, and the person who's working with this file is using IntelliJ to modify it, um, you can actually read it through, and everything's in the right order here. I mean, even with the square brackets and stuff, it's like it's right to left here. Um, but obviously, it doesn't have quite the same rules. So if we run the tests here, so it's running it with the unreadable one. Uh, that's actually parsing the test. What's not parsing the test is the one that we'd like to have. What it's showing is, as, as you might imagine, um, slash to slash, because, well, string format doesn't know what to do with that. Fortunately, we were using parser combinators. So we kind of cheated a bit, and we basically just added that line in. And what that does is that just replaces slash, number, slash. We don't even need the plus there, actually. We never know. We never go above uh, one digit on that. Just replaces it with our sort of expected one, which is uh, percent n dollar s. And, uh, and it works. We can read it, and we can modify that. That actually able, enabled us to cut out um, huge tranches of code that would have um, otherwise been there to enable us to write this config in some alphanumeric alphabet to then convert that into an Arabic string. Um, and it would just have been a whole lot more headache. As it stood, we were able to make the thing more readable um, with just an extra line in the code, um, which was a really pleasant win that wasn't anticipated when we started doing stuff with parser combinators to begin with. Um, so yeah, that's all online. Um, if anyone's sort of interested enough to have a look at sort of how that went. Um, and uh, yeah, there's the, there's the address for you.